Welcome to the Cool Instruments for Het Cats podcast and the world of creating musical sounds where every note has a story. In this podcast, we delve into the fascinating realm of unusual and intriguing musical instruments. From the depths of history to the cutting edge of innovation, we'll explore the instruments that have, or will, push the boundaries of what we consider music. Join us on a journey of discovery as we uncover the secrets of the world's most fascinating instruments, the people who play them, and the music they create. Now here is your host, Dr. Donald Rickett. You're here uh, with us today. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm broadcasting from the Towns County Public Library meeting room in Hiawassee, Georgia. And that's in the Appalachian Mountains in uh, North Georgia, USA. And Daniela, where are you right now? Hello, I'm uh, in um, Meltina, which is uh, Italy, the very north of Italy, very close to, to Austria. I'm in the mountain too, as you can see from my window. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and I'm very curious. I really can't wait to see what's coming out of this world Syria. Looks so interesting and fun. I know everybody hates this question, but do you mind tell, telling our uh, listeners what a little bit about yourself? Yes, okay. So my name is Daniela Gaidano and uh, I'm Italian. I'm a valley maker in Italy. But before being a violin maker, I've been a professional violin and viola player on modern and period instruments. And uh, I've also been a gut string maker for 15 years. So this is my background. Yeah, you used to work for the company Aquila, is that yeah. true? Yeah, the correct pronounce is Aquila. <laughs> Which means eagle. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, I got, uh, apparently is, I, I thought I had the rules of Italian pronunciation down, but... No, Aquila is how it is pronounced in the whole world. <laughs> so never mind. Yes, I was a co-owner of Aquila Strings uh, Company. And I also ran uh, the ukulele shop and distributor for Italy for 10 years. So I was uh, setting up and selling ukes for quite a lot of time. But my main job was uh, checking the, the quality, that doing the final quality test of the gut strings, which actually doesn't mean only looking at them, but it means doing this kind of test. I don't have a string here to show it, but doing this and see the fuse and deciding if this string had to be uh, put into the polishing machine again to get it better or if it was ready. So it was actually polishing strings every day. I was doing something like 1000 right. strings per day, but working one day per week at this job. So this is why when you buy smooth gut strings, you are actually buying the waltz strings that were not uh, vibrating evenly when they were still a bit rough and uh, natural. Daniela, Tell our listeners what a violoncello de spalla is. I mean, even like what is the what does the name mean? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, let me show you. This is a violoncello de spalla. It has uh, five strings. So basically, first the basics. It's bigger, larger than a viola. The ribs are wider, are higher than a viola. And Quite it has a bit. five strings. Uh, it is tuned like a cello, precisely like a cello at the same octave. And it is not played like that, at least not from someone, yes, but not from me. It is held with a strap, show you. like this. So that I'm quite comfortable playing it 
actually more comfortable than a viola because with the viola I'd be like that. See my hand. Yeah. Well, with a violoncello da spalla, I, I do. I'm really much, much more comfortable. And that's it. It's as I said, tuned like a cello, which means that it you can play with it the same repertoire as a as a normal cello, but you have one string more, so it's it's easier. I mean, when you play Bach suites you don't have almost any uh, shifting of position except for the sixth, sixth suite, of course. <coughs> and... No, tell me about... The, what, what did you say about a sixth string? Uh, no, the sixth... Uh, did you say string. sixth string or did I just miss it? No, no, <laughs> I said sixth suite. <laughs> maybe, maybe I... Bach sixth suite has five strings. So you have a lot of shifti shifting of positions there, but all the other suites you can play almost without any shifting of position, which gets them so easier and comfortable. The other easier thing is that you have an octave from first to fourth finger. So, you, I mean, cellists are doing a lot of work like this to take all the notes while we are simply, sorry, simply, we have everything in here. So that's quite an, I don't want to say easy, because uh, you need anyway a good violin or viola technique to play it, um, but it's a more comfortable instrument than viola and than cello, sorry, to play Bach's suite. <laughs> that, uh, about the meaning of a violoncello da spalla, uh, this brings me to speak about the history of the instrument, and the first thing I want to split it into violoncello and da spalla. Da spalla in Italian means on the shoulder, for the shoulder actually. And uh, we know that uh, family, no, I wouldn't say that. On the shoulder and so violoncello da spalla, it's something, not uh, something so small, but something in general that's played horizontally leaning on the left, on the right <laughs> shoulder. And uh, I want to say that this is how we intend today. In the past, the term violoncello da spalla was used only once in the Bismantova Treatise in uh, 1694, I think. Uh, so this is, and then was used again uh, in the Kinski catalog uh, of Leipzig Museum. But not really in between of these two episodes. So how did they use, uh, the thing is, in Italy, they were using even larger instruments in this way, in this position, because they were playing very often in balconies, like we see here. This is an image that uh, it's from a treatise in, oh, really? in Bologna, yes. And uh, we have many images like that. Cool, yeah. You see here? And another one here. I will send all these to you so you can do something nice with them. Yeah, very interesting. And another one with a very small one at the end of the line there. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, I cannot open this. Yes, this one. So these are images from Bologna in the 1722-24, and they show that when they were uh, tightened in a, in a balcony, they tried to play whenever they could. So this is what we mean for da spalla position. There is also a very famous image from a um, church in Cremona that clearly shows that big instruments were, were played this way. So. Why today we call violoncello da spalla something so small? This is the, the main uh, question. Because uh, in the mm, end of the 17th century, there was an invention that completely changed the, the way they could use instruments. Which was, well, first, we spoke about gut strings. You have to think that, <coughs> sorry, 
until 16 something, the only material they had to make strings was gut, just one material. So it, it, it's a bit like uh, today's guitar strings that are made of yeah. the first three made of plastic, any kind of plastic, but it's the same material going bigger from the first to the third. And this is more or less the same thing. If uh, they had. You know, when you say plastic, you mean. I mean, nylon, carbon, whatever, but normally a, a classical, oh, okay. a classical okay. guitar today has uh, the first three strings uh, uh, of the same material and they have a gauge going bigger from the first to the third. And the same were our four string instruments in the 17th century. Uh, the first string was very thin and then if you maintain the same vibrating length, if you had an instrument like this, that you have the same length from here to here, not like an harp that you have different lengths, here you can have the first mm -hmm. string very thin, the second bigger, and then going on, you had the third bigger and the fourth even bigger. What happened in uh, 16 and a half, mid 17th century, that they invented the way of having a gas string covered with a metal wire so that the string could become heavier and thinner. This way, on the same length, they right. could have a thinner string that could play be as resonant as the first one. So the, a third round is as resonant as the first and has more or less the same gauge. And same for the fourth, which comes as big as the second and as resonant as the second. This allowed them to tune the same instrument one fifth lower. This is the big change that when we had instruments this big that we already had and were probably tenor or baritone instrument, like we see here, this is uh, Orlando di Lasso 15, uh, I don't know, 1560, something like that. And you can see that in we have this, sorry, oh, this instrument here, on the back here, it's more or less the same uh, mm -hmm. size of the violoncello da spalla, but it was probably tuned higher before, while uh, after the half of the 17th century, using the modern uh, one string invented, they could tune the same instrument one, fi one fifth lower. So, while in Italy they were playing all sorts of big instruments in the Spalla way when they need it, probably, this is what I think, but it's not being confirmed by the official research and scholars yet, that going north, going in Germany, they probably decided that it was easier to tune lower, smaller instruments, so to, to have more portable. Now, basis. say more about the, the easier to tune. Yes. So easiest. Now, the thing is, um, when you have a more resonant string, you can, at the same length, tune one fifth lower, or you can take a very big instrument, a huge instrument, and make it shorter. This makes, makes it more portable and more easy to play also, because you have, you can reach notes with your fingers. So, what I think is that probably going, right. while, while in Italy they were still using these big instruments, going north, going in Germany, they started to use smaller instruments, more portable. And also in Germany they had a lot of small churches with small balconades, so it was easiest to carry on the balconades small bases than the very big church bases. So, what I think is that yeah. is that Johann Sebastian Bach, that was also always very um, curious about novelties, about uh, exotic instruments, and also he, he was very updated with the novelty of music and in touch with the music coming from Italy, from Vivaldi, from Venice. He wanted to use this instrument partly because of he wanted to show his connections with Italy, but also because he wanted something new, something modern. So he probably uh, developed together with Hoffman, who was his great friend. They were so 
as, as friends that they got fathered each other's son. So they were friends and they were uh, neighbors, home neighbors. Probably they developed together this small bass with, with five strings. Cool Instruments for Het Cats is brought to you by Don Rickett Musical Instruments, designers and makers of bespoke stringed instruments. All music clips were either recorded in the making of the podcast and played by the guest or guests, who have granted permission to use the clips, or otherwise, used with permission or in accordance with fair use regulations. The music for the intro and outro sequences is performed by the group attire on jaw harp and djembe and is used with written permission.